Good morning and welcome back from the holidays. It's our first edition of the show Frontier Opening Bell since the May Day uh, Workers' Day. We do hope you have a productive week on, uh, moving on now that we have resumed from the holidays. Let's see off with the markets. Uh, where did we finish off uh, before the holidays? Nigeria was positive. Uh, that was on Friday specifically by some 95 business points. The BRVM stock exchange went higher by 25 business points on Monday. And of course, the Egyptian stock exchange in Cairo was down 1.10% midweek. We moved to the Nairobi Stock Exchange in Kenya. There, it was a bit of a positive trend as well, some 0.27% on Monday. And we've got the uh, uh, Johannesburg Stock Exchange in South Africa uh, closing lower on Monday by some 52 basis points. Let's now look at the Eastern African headlines where you have I&M Holdings completing some 90% purchase of Orient Bank Uganda. MTN Rwanda is to list some 1.35 billion ordinary shares at uh, 269 Rwandan franc per share on May the 4th, which is today. Uh, Kenya's inflation declined marginally by 5.8% in April within the Central Bank of Kenya's mid-term target. We understand that was a reduction from 5.9%. Offshore inflows, NGOs, coffee exports, boy, Uganda's shilling. And in Tanzania, the cigarette company there, the profit was down by 30% in 2020. Of, of course, we understand that uh, the president of Tanzania will also be meeting with uh, the president of Kenya uh, today. So we'll bring these headlines to you, uh, Ali Kansachi, to help us uh, digest them. And I guess I haven't done the introduction for the show today. Uh, we've got Ali Kansachi. This is unusual. Ali Kansachi, the rich uh, head of uh, rich frontiers in Nairobi, Kenya, Bosin Omofaya, executive editor here at Frontier Africa Reports. And we've got Onyeka Ijoma from Vetiva Capital Management joining us as well to give us some headlines and uh, analysis on these headlines. Ali, let's come to you with this East African headlines now. Okay, let, let me start with uh, the story that's not on your headlines, which is the visit of the Tanzanian president uh, to Nairobi, two-day state visit. Uh, rolled out of all um, uh, uh, state honours. I think she's speaking uh, to Parliament as well. Um, of course, uh, as you know, the background, this was, um, uh, she took over after President Magifuli passed away. Um, uh, Magifuli was a, a kind of larger-than-life figure um, uh, and a lot of people thought that it would be difficult to fill his shoes. Um, I follow a lot of Tanzanian commentators uh, who were deeply unhappy with Magafuli. They haven't sort of struck a truce yet with the Tanzanian president. But from my uh, observation, let me say the following. Um, she clearly is, I believe, a very sharp Operator. She's already signed off on the pipeline with Uganda. She visited Mussolini quite recently. She has taken the opportunity of what's going on in Cabo Delgado and Mozambique to reboot the Tanzanian gas story down south in Matwara. She, um, uh, over the weekend, announced uh, an incremental cut in the PAYE rate in Tanzania. This is not something that you associate with the Tanzanian government. She's making Tanzania, obviously she's pitching it as a, an attractive destination to come and invest in and set up businesses. According to anecdotal evidence, it was very difficult for Kenyans to get work permits in Tanzania. This has changed overnight. So the way, if I look at what I'm seeing, I'm seeing somebody who's moving, okay, people complaining about the masks, saying she's wearing masks when she goes abroad, but at home she's not. Um, uh, and, and, and some folks are upset at that, saying that you know, she's not dealing with uh, this whole COVID issue appropriately. But, you know, the whole mask thing was very big with Magafuli. It might not be as easy uh, to distance oneself from that as it would be from other things. But my overall impression is she's moving with dispatch, she's moving with subtlety, and she's going to be a formidable player in the East African community. And those who are underestimating her are making a grave error. And uh, I look forward to seeing what she says here. 
Um, Kenya has become a high tax economy as the government keeps on uh, lurching from one tax rise to another to try, try and square off this huge borrowing splurge that we've had, which has produced a pathetic return on investment. And if I were betting on this com competition, my money would be on this lady because all the messages and signals I'm taking away are that she means business. She understands business. She understands messaging. And if you listen to her messages, they're coming across loud and clear. So it will be an interesting two-day visit. Let's see how it goes. But, you know, I, really, she's caught my attention, I've got to say. Going to your headlines, if I may quick, quickly, INN Holdings completes 90% purchase of Orient Bank Uganda. This is in line with a lot of what banks are doing, not only in East Africa, but also in West Africa. It's, it's a real estate grab at the moment. You're, you know, people are trying to expand their regional footprint. The INM Holdings, it's a 90% it's a acquisition for about $27 million. And in the scheme of things, you're getting a license, you're getting a presence, but really it's about how you go to build that business. And I think that's also in line with what Access Bank is doing with transnational bank here in Kenya, you're better off buying these tier three banks and then beating them up um, uh, as long as you don't have legacy problems. So that's I'm uh, uh, third most profitable bank in Kenya, sixth by market capitalization, trading on an inexpensive PE ratio of 4.6. NTN, that's a big story. Um, uh, listing on the Rwanda Stock Exchange. It's a transformative moment for the Rwanda boss because you would expect volumes to double, if not treble, going forward with that listing. Um, and uh, I think it will be a significant uh, 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 feather in the cap of the Rwandan government and their intention around building the capital markets uh, going forward. Can the inflation drop marginally to 5.8% in April? I think that's a base effect situation because if you look back in April last year, you know, the country came to a standstill. Because if I look at the components of the basket, you know, fuel, well, you know, you guys are doing hoops in Nigeria because the fuel prices jumped, but we're a fuel taker. We're not doing hoops right now. and We've got a big price adjustment coming through. The government um, uh, withheld feeding through the price adjustment last month by dumping it on the uh, oil marketers. Um, I don't think they're going to do that again. It's going to be difficult to pull that one off. Um, uh, Uganda, offshore inflows, NGOs, coffee exports. The coffee export story is a big one that people might miss. They've ramped up coffee production in Uganda. It's really dramatic. I think they're earning six to seven hundred million dollars a year. It's become very, very meaningful. Uh, Tanzanian cigarette company profit down thirty percent. Well, obviously, you know, consumption uh, last year was lower. Um, uh, this this is an interesting data point. Uh, the Economist picked up on beer in Tanzania when they were comparing the GDP numbers to to uh, these sorts of data points. So it'll be interesting to see whether um, that also uh, correlates with the lower GDP uh, expectation. Thank you very much, Ali. Uh, I mean, your level of bullishness and optimism on President Hassan uh, looks like you're eyeing the Tanzanian market <laughs> now. We'll see how that pans out eventually. <laughs> yes. It's a good term box at 16%. <laughs> <laughs> Great to know all of this. Mostly you got yes. the floor. I'm sure you would like to have a go with the uh, MTN story, getting listed on the market. You can bet, Temple. I've been looking at the pictures. Yeah. I've been looking at the pictures. You know, the MTN CEO went to meet with President Kagame. I saw that on Twitter. I put out the images we're going to put up on the show later uh, for, 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 for those who are missing it. We're going to edit it to, to the show today. It's going to be very interesting when we went to meet President uh, Kagame. Of course, he's quite excited to have Africa's largest telco released on his own country's very small stock exchange. That's a very big addition when you got it. When we got MTN in Nigeria, it was a big move. When the DVR uh, uh, listing in Ghana, it was such a very big move as well. And you see the pictures from the trading floor. I think they're having some nice lunch by this time. I'm looking at some of the pictures you know, as a journalist. I look beyond the net beyond the front line. So I saw nice table set with some glasses on the table. So I think it's good to fetch themselves to 
So this is a very big company coming to a great country on the African continent, which is Rwanda. And I say congratulations uh, to them. At about 250, 200 and whatever Rwanda francs, that's a good, that's a big way to come in. You know, the last big listing they have, I'm sure uh, Ali remember, was Mawa Cement, which was just earlier in the year. And now from that cement company to a telco giant like this, I think it's a win-win situation. I have my money on this woman as well. Look, we need to have this type of uh, leaders in Africa. I think we need more women, by the way, if you ask me. Uh, to push the guys around the room a little bit and, and try to do things differently. This boots on the ground diplomacy that she's doing, instead of just sitting down in the office and feeling like a big woman, which she already is, this doesn't going to do anybody any good. East Africa needs a whole lot more cooperation. You need a whole lot of integration. You need to work a whole lot better, especially with the under the new EFCFTA. So I love what she's doing. I wish we can do the same here in West Africa. I wish we have a Nigerian president who will move around the corridors of West Africa a whole lot faster, almost on a daily basis, doing boots on the ground diplomacy, trying to rally the Anglophone and the Francophone countries together. The issue of Nigerian traders in Ghana still being pushed out because of the $1 million certification requirement is there. It hasn't been resolved. So you need presidents who are not just sitting back in the villa and just feeling like a big man. With due respect, we need to move. Nigeria needs to move and push its weight around and, and get everybody on the same page uh, within the West African space. And what this woman is doing is just really good. Congratulations to her. Thank you very much for those editorials there, uh, Bosin. Let's move on now to the West African headline and, of course, the Nigerian markets uh, stories before us. Nigeria's Bureau of Public Enterprise announces plans to sell five IPP Jenkos. Um, Honeywell, you've got First Bank Loan being serviced down 30% in two and a half years. Ghana Revenue Authority going digital from June the 1st. NCR Group. Propaco signs new deal to finance Ivorian companies. And you've got this coming from the BRBM stock exchange that Sonatel grows its profit by more than 26%, so 55 billion sepher franc in the first quarter of the year. Let's come to you, um, Onyeka, with these headlines from the Nigerian and West African uh, end of things. Um, thank you very much, Temple. Um, I'll start with the PPE story. Um, we saw about them looking to, you know, divest um, about five, some of about five um, integrated power plants um, to private in, to private investors. This is a story that you know um, has come up quite a few times over the past two or three years now. Um, the Bureau of Public Enterprises um, working with the National Integrated Power Plants. Um, have been looking to divest for a while. I know they looked, they, they um, invited some technical advisors to review the state of these of these um, power plants um, sometime in the last two years, um, you know, to do independent valuations and all before they put them in the market. So I think it's a good thing that, you know, we're seeing them move forward. Um, I think that these, these, these plants, they already have significant private investment anyways. They, they aren't fully owned by the government. Um, Durable, for example, which is one of the plants that um, is looking that is going to be sold off, um, is already is almost 50% owned by um, the um, Imperial Distribution Company, which is which was formerly a part of 40 oil, but is now owned by um the last company. I seem to forget the name. And all, um, but I think about you know moving it hundred percent into the private sector will still be a positive thing. However, the key thing with the power sector in Nigeria is still you know it's still going to it's still going to be about making um, improving the tariffs to to make them a lot more cost reflective, um, improving our transmission um, capacity and efficiency, and just improving our distribution network. Um, Looking at the report from the um, from the meter um, from from the metering project, um, we are still significantly below our objective, even though the timelines for that have passed. And yes, we can give some concessions because of COVID, but we are still far from from, from our objective. Um, looking at the first bank story. We know that last week was, <laughs> was a very bizarre story in that space. Um, 
you know, between the CBN and the um, FBN's board of directors. Um, and it seems like the CBN is bringing down the hammer on First Bank on First Bank's activities, um, especially with regards to related parties um, such as um, the chairman of First Bank. You know who also owns Hongwell. Um, apparently, according to details from the CBN, um, Hongwell has not been servicing its debt, and there was um, there was um, already an instruction from the CBN for um, First Bank to place a yen on the chairman's shares um, a couple of years ago. However, this has not happened um, yet, and um, we are now seeing Hongwell sort of scramble to make sure that you know the company, you know, um, remains a going concern even with all these issues um, with the CBN. I do hope that it doesn't affect the um, activities of Honeywell. They still produce, they're still one of the major flower producers in the country. And with this um, FX ban looming, um, the FX ban on flour and sugar, or, or milk and sugar looming over our heads, we need um, all the wheat producers that, that we can um, that, that, that we can keep. Um, beyond that, um, looking at the rest of the stories, um, we saw recently Ghana's revenue authority going digital from the 1st of June. <laughs> Very impressive. Uh, we've talked about Ghana a couple of times here. Um, they seem to be positioning themselves to be the Singapore of, of Africa. Um, I know that um, it's something that they seem to be fiercely contested with Rwanda who are making all the right moves. Relatively small countries, um, countries in terms of population and, you know, just general land area. But, you know, they're making heavy moves in attracting, you know, foreign direct investment. Um, and, you know, this is, just, this is just one of them. You know, um, however, I do hope that this will be a proper digital shift, you know, with, with proper digital tools. We tend to see a lot of this in Nigeria where we go digital, but we are not digital. Um, you know, you, you, you have to log into a portal, but then you print out a slip and take it to the revenue authority, who then give you a stamp, and then you take it back to the bank. I do hope that this is properly executed, and if it is, it, it will it will be very impressive for, for for Ghana. But again, you know, they seem to be making all the right moves, um, and it's it's no wonder that they they'll continue to um, attract you know strong uh, FDI. All right, thank you so much, Rieka. I Appreciate all of those uh, analysis coming from you, uh, Bosin. Uh, would you like to make some contributions before we move to the South African headlines? Yes, yes, very very quickly on the Honeywell story. You know, I think this loan. Well, the first bank went to uh, Honeywell Holdings, which has the Honeywell flower, and they're also in the oil industry, by the way. So most likely this loan did not go to the flower company, most likely, and I'm not too sure here, so I'm speaking uh, without very caveat here, it's most likely that this fund, which was gotten from first bank, went into the oil and gas industry five years, six years ago or so, when the whole issue with oil and gas was there. If you remember, quite a number of Nigerian banks went into the oil and gas lending and within that period, the beat into electricity and what have you. So now that Honeywell Holdings now is saying, look, uh, this loan has been serviced about 30%. They say they have a cover of 170%. They've got about 230% or so, uh, mark to market kind of whatever. Now that they're explaining all of this, we'll see what the response will be from the central bank that says, look, you, don't, you haven't provided enough collateral on this loan and what have you. The part of Honeywell Holdings that is directly exposed to the market is the flower company. So I know that most likely this loan will come from the oil and gas, definitely not the flower business, not most likely. It's likely to be the Honeywell drilling, oil exploration, oil services, whatever industry. And with what we saw in the oil industry over the last few years, we all know what happened to oil prices. So most likely they got bonds within that business and they're trying to, and I'm not too sure the flower company would have been strong enough to be able to provide that money which was went into the Honeywell uh, oil and gas, whatever business side of it. So we're beginning to see more. I think it's like an onion. We're peeling the layers little by little and we're seeing more. So you peel one layer, you see another one, another one, another one. So we're going to get a whole lot more uh, when we get into that. I think the IPP story, the NIPP story, BP, we're not sure where the Bukharis administration is going. If they want to do this five, let them do it. Send the second Gerigo. Next dot to it was the one that uh, Tedola uh, bought, which uh, 
um, uh, uh, Oyeka spoke about earlier, these are one of the newest uh, 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 plants that were done under the Niger Delta Power Holding Company arrangement. Will it be a game changer for Nigeria? Well, maybe to help us move a little few steps forward, but it's not going to be an Eldorado. So let no one be under any illusion that selling these Jenkos to private investors. The government is hard for money. While this administration is looking for money left, right, and center, it's recording on its own debt. It's moving to sell private assets. That's what it's all about. So it's about the money, not about the fact that power tariff is going to get uh, 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 lower or that we're going to have increased number of hours of electricity. Make no mistake about it. It's about the money. The administration is hard put for cash, and they're looking for any more dollar where they can find it. Thank you very much, Bosin, for all of that. Let's move on to the Southern African markets, where Sanlam plans to buy 22.8% stake in Saham Assurance Maroc, basically to increase its stake in that company. Zimbabwe Infrastructure reports and focus of webinar events, which is happening live today. PPC Limited sells Lime business to uh, Gatsalopele Lime for 515 million rand. You have General Beltings proposing some 7.64 million Zimbabwean dollars gross dividend for the 2020 financial year. ZSE, first capital bank, turns to profit a total income as up by some 19%, so $127.3 million. And it will bring them to you right now for your analysis. So uh, just let me uh, first of all start with uh, Sanlan. Sanlan took a stake in Saham a while ago and obviously is seeking to build on its uh, position there. And I think that's a sensible option. It opens up uh, North Africa to Sanlan and that market is pretty substantial. So um, it's, uh, I think that, that, you know, that's a positive development. If I can just then touch on uh, First Capital Bank turning to profit in Zimbabwe, um, essentially in, in an environment where you're getting more stability in the foreign exchange rate, you're getting lower inflation, therefore lower interest rates, this is supportive. Uh, these, these macro, uh, that sort of macro environment is supportive of banks going forward. It'll be interesting to see uh, which Zimbabwean banks can ride that wave. Um, and definitely, I think, uh, if you do like looking for opportunities off the beaten track, uh, the banking sector in Zimbabwe might be one of those. I was surprised PPC selling its lime business simply because lime is such a component of cement. Um, I don't know what the backstory is to that, but uh, it, you know, a lot of cement companies will look first for a uh, resource before they actually go 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 for uh, production so it's an interesting uh, scenario thank you so much Ali Bosin. well I, I think I love the uh, I don't know what the I love the the Salem story sure it's in South Africa um, uh, making inroads into into the North African uh, insurance market like I said look, we need to increase trade in Africa, but we also need to increase consolidation, cross-border listing, cross-border investment, and, and, and cross-border whatever, whether it's in private equity or you take it, whatever. It helps integrate the continent a little bit better. That is part of what Frontier Africa Report is all about. We want to see more of this happen. We want to see insurance companies from East, from East Africa, North Africa doing business in West Africa. We want to see the French doing business with the Portuguese out Southern Africa. We want to see a bank from Malawi operate in Nigeria. We want to see the bank from the Republic operate in South Africa. That is how the world integration and knowing me, knowing you will get the continent a whole lot better. And this is one pretty good news, by the way. We'll give it to them. Thank you so much. Uh, Onyeka, let me just give you some 66 to speak to the Sanlam story. I mean, I know you know that they bought some of the stake or insurance stake of First Bank or FBN Holdings in Nigeria. Um, yeah, so we, we do know that you know, this, um, we're trying to expand significantly across, um, across Africa in, in general. Um, the insurance space is, um, and I think across, across the whole of Africa, we've been seeing significant consolidation and just significant consolidation across that space. Um, we are seeing that there hasn't been lots of regulatory change in, 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 in a number of years, and most of the most of the countries' um, regulators are waking up, and so this has opened the door to um, you know this 
um, m and &E activity in the space, and I think we will continue to see more across the space, which is apt, by the way, which, which should happen. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Onyeka, for that. Let's uh, finish the show now with the uh, Northern African headlines. Egypt, Libya meets to discuss investment opportunities. Egyptian President Abdel al-Sisi endorses $95 million OPEC fund for MSMEs in that country. In Morocco, you have Mutandi's revenue falling by 10% to 300 million dirhams in the first quarter of this year. Credits due Maroc first quarter net group shares profits up by some 25% and land or first quarter sales up by 32% as production rises by 34%. Quite a number of macro and a bit of uh, corporate stories there for you, Ali. Yes, um, uh, let me start with Libya. I mean, you know, Libya is a very interesting scenario has developed there. Um, you've got a, a whole bunch of different players operating. You've got Russia, which was backing Haftar. You got Turkey, which was backing the government of national unity on on each on the other side. You've got the Europeans, uh, and uh, therefore, you know, I think it makes sense for Egypt, with because of its proximity, um, uh, to be reaching out. Uh, and I think there's an enormous opportunity for Egypt and Libya to collaborate. Uh, uh, you know, as they try and rebuild Libya, so. That's an interesting development. President Sisi um, endorsing $95 million OPEC fund for the MSMEs. Look, uh, we've spoken about this severally. They know how to tap the money from multilaterals, whether it's OPEC fund, EBRD, UK, to name it. There's a lot of capital that wants to be deployed into Egypt. And I think they'll continue, that spigot will continue to, uh, to run. And that's a very positive step for the Egyptians. It shows there's plenty of liquidity. Liquidity is not a constraint for Egypt, which is something few other African countries would be able to pronounce on. Thank you so much, Ali. Uh, Bosin, I'm sure you'll be interested in uh, President al Sisi's moves, who's been making funds and available to his, uh, his citizens there. Well, Temple, all you, can, you, all you end up getting me to is salivate over what Egypt is getting. Uh, so uh, I'm just going to keep my comment very short because, again, with the OPEC fund, when OPEC fund for development, which is a strategic fund by OPEC, is investing in your country, that means you have what it takes. That means the, the environment, the soil for investment is right. And this is the kind of fund that we need in Nigeria, but this not, Nigeria is not getting it. So we need to fertilize the soil in Nigeria for funds such as these to, to, to come in. Thank you so I'm much. sure you can, you can, will agree with me. Oh, you yeah, can comments on this. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I mean, yeah, we're, we're definitely seeing, we're definitely seeing a lot of DFIs, um, you know, pushing investments across, across, you know, the rest of Africa. It doesn't seem to be coming into Nigeria. Um, in the in West Africa story, we saw the news of tobacco investing significant amounts in um, Ivory Coast. Um, a couple of weeks ago, it was Kenya who were investing in. Um, I mean, when Kenya is looking to India, they've been fighting to turn down, for the president to turn down funding from the IMF and the World Bank. We don't have that option in Nigeria because, you, you know, um, our economic metrics aren't really strong. Uh, we tend not to meet most of the requirements, even though we require this funding um, quite a lot more. Um, so, yes, I do agree with um, Boas in that, you know, things do need to improve in Nigeria so we can access some of this funding. Uh, from Vetiver Capital Management, thanks a great deal for your appearance and your analysis on the show this morning. Ali Kansachu, founder of Rich Franchise Management in Nairobi, based in Kenya. Thank you so much for your bullishness on Tanzania and for the integration of that market. That's something that Boson would like to see happen more, integration. And by the time we open Frontier Africa reports in the eastern part of Africa as well. Thank you, Boson, our executive uh, editor here at FAR. I appreciate your insights. This has been the show for today. You have a productive and a profitable day. I'll see you next time. Bye for Thank now. You.